neuroscience, especially cognitive neuroscience, grew out, I think without exaggeration from philosophy, with a lot of garbage behind it. So all our thinking is, uh, and all our terms, or most of our terms, in fact, come from the Greeks. Aristotle coined many of the terms that we are still using today, such as cognition, uh, motivation, emotions, memory, and so on. And then, perhaps with the uh, British Empiricist School, neuroscience got into a position where the way to understand the brain is to ask questions from the brain. And this is what's being done even today, that you pre present a question to the brain and you look at the correspondence. And this is, of course, is a very fast way to progress because you got answers, but you get into trouble very quickly when you would like to understand the deeper parts of the brain or when you get into questions such as emotions or memory or those things that are not related directly with the interaction with the world. To explain it a little bit uh, in a more plain language, if you would like to understand the language, the easiest way to do is to learn words. I can learn 100 Danish words and I can get by pretty easily. But once I'd like to un try to understand the essence of a language, I have to understand its grammar. And grammar or syntax is the most essential thing in any communication system. You have to know where the message begins and the message ends. You have to learn about punctuation. You have to learn about segmentation. Uh, especially these rules are extremely important when it comes to a unknown language such as the hieroglyph or the language of the brain. So I realized, I didn't realize, I realize it now after many years that what we were actually been working on is generating a, a neural syntax or a brain grammar because we realized that segmentation of information in the brain is done by the many type of rhythms the brain generates. So over the years we realized, not me, but the whole community, there are many different types of rhythms starting from uh, once every 40 seconds all the way to about 200 or 600 per second. Now, what we found is that it's not only that there are multiple rhythms in the brain, but in fact, every frequency range is covered by some brain oscillator. It is like the periodic system in chemistry, that there, are, there, are, uh, there is a system. There is a system of oscillations in the brain. Later on, we find also that it's, it's indeed a system because they are very strongly interdependent, so much so that you can put any of these os or all of these oscillations on a natural logarithm scale. Now, this became very interesting when we, we, we found that because a natural logarithm is an irrational number, which means that these different rhythms cannot get entrained. It's, it's a very complicated music. It's not that you follow the drum, because you always get out of rhythm. And the second rule was very similar to what, uh, what uh, Sebastian Bach discovered, for example, is that in order to make something pleasing, something interesting, is that you have to make prediction on the long term from short term interactions. And it turned out that every rhythm can modulate, every slower rhythm can modulate the faster rhythm. Uh, so it turned out that it's a beautiful structure. This is what I call brain grammar or neural syntax, which allows segmenting the information. Now, in order to give a punctuation mark, it says full stop, it can be achieved nicely because these rhythms are up and down, up and down kind of changes of excitability. And all the full stops are provided by inhibition. And this is where the work of Tamás Freund and, and Peter Schomagy are extremely important because we had to understand how this dynamic is controlled and what neurons and what structure and what interactions are able to deal with this very complicated interaction.